by two of my colleagues, Marcus Ali and Simi. Simi, how are you getting on this, this afternoon, mate? You all good? Yeah, all good. Um, just trying to stay out of this heat, to be honest. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Fans on there next to me, so much needed in this heat, I think. Absolutely. It is a real toasty one this afternoon. Marcus, how are you getting on? Yeah, getting by, Sam. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be an exciting one. The transfer window is really cranking up just as the Celsius in England. So, no, really looking forward to seeing these clubs sort of cram in these signings in, in the two weeks that remains before the season starts. You've definitely been waiting to say that all afternoon. Uh, it's good to see. But there we go. Uh, we are broadcasting live on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. So please do get yourself in the comments. Uh, let us know your thoughts on some of the transfer rumours and done deals we're going to be talking about on today's show. Uh, and also let us know who you'd like your club to sign in this summer transfer window. Let's get straight into it. Right, the first half of this show this afternoon, we're going to be taking a look at some done deals, some EFL transfers that have been concluded over the last few days. Right, let's start at West Bromwich Albion. Uh, they complete, completed uh, another free transfer in the form of OK Yakuslu. He returns to the club after a loan stint back in 2020 21. Uh, was a really impressive figure in that Premier League team. Uh, his uh, contract at Celta Vigo expired uh, this summer, and Steve Bruce has brought him back to the Hawthorns, much to the delight of many Baggies fans, it seems. Uh, Marcus, let's come to you first. On this one, There's, there did seem to be a need to, to bolster the central midfield options at West Brom. What do you make of this one? Do you think Yakuza will, will really enhance what they've currently got? Um, I think he had something different. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how he gets on. Obviously, it was a very poor baggy side that he did stand out in in the second half of 2020-21. There were murmurs that um, they were interested in bringing him back to the club, uh, definitely in January, potentially even last summer as well. So finally, they've, they've managed to get their man. Um, looking at that that central midfield department as well, obviously they made um, Jason Malumbi's loan from Brighton permanent this summer as well. So I think he sort of goes in direct competition with him potentially to, to, uh, to partner Alex Mowat in, in central midfield. Um, I think Bruce is probably looking at a 4-2-3-1 formation next season to try and get the best out of John Swift. So it's about how they can um, sort of solidify that, that, that base behind him and the other attacking players that they've signed. But... Um, of course, the absence of a transfer fee in this one as well, making it really impressive when they've already brought in Wallace and Swift for, with, without um, attaching a, a transfer fee there. So it's going to be in it's interesting to see how he gets on. Obviously, he had a bit of a up and down season last season in, in Spain. Um, and obviously, there's, there's Jake Livermore in the fold as well, someone that's been at the club for a long time. So um, he'll have to really assert himself in, in the closing exchanges of pre-season, potentially could be one that, that will break in a few weeks after the season starts when we, when we start getting a bit, little bit of fixture congestion. But I think he definitely made his mark um, at the back end of 2020-21. Um, so, yeah, definitely a one that, that's given the, the supporters a boost ahead of the season and, and does make that midfield uh, contingent look a little bit more solid ahead of what's going to be a very hectic campaign. Yeah, Simon, what's your thoughts on this particular deal? Do you think it's a, a good signing for the Baggies? Yeah, I do I do like this one. Yeah, as we sort of talked about there, he did sort of come in in that January window um, during the, the promo, uh, Premier League season and, you know, have a really positive impact. I know from my own personal, you know, because I'm a Watford fan, he was linked with us last summer. And when we didn't sign him, a lot of fans were, were quite upset that, we didn't get him in for our Premier League campaign. So I think to do it for, for the championship for West Brom is a, is a good deal. And, and another thing I really like about this one and, and the Wallace one and the Swift as well, they're free agent signings that are not ageing. They're all sort of in their prime years, you know. Yakuzlu, um, 28 years old, three-year deal. They've sort of tied him up for his, his prime years. So worst case scenario, it doesn't they don't go up this year. They've still got him tied down for a further two years. So I think, yeah, there's a lot to like about this deal. Yeah, it's a very good point. You know, they are players that very much are at the peak of their powers right now in terms of their career. Uh, any Baggies fans, let us know in the comments uh, your thoughts on your Kuzlu's arrival at the Hawthorns. Are you happy to see him return to the club? And you also expect him to be a guaranteed starter in Steve Bruce's 11 uh, next term. Let us know. Right, let's look at some more done deals next. 
Uh, Barnsley have completed the signing of James Norwood following his exit from Ipswich Town. It pretty much looked on the cards that Norwood was to depart Portman Road uh, this summer. There were a number of clubs linked with a move uh, for the former Tranmere Rovers striker Pompey and Charlton once linked with the player, but he has arrived at Michael Duff's Barnsley. Marcus, let's come to you then on this one. Good addition for the Tykes because they have lost a number of their key strikers this summer, haven't they? Um, definitely looking at the squad depth, I think it's a positive addition as well. Um, picking up a free agent of, of Norwood's quality is, is, is impressive at, um, for the level. I'd argue he's, he's probably not a promotion-pushing striker at League One if he's going to be your, your first choice um, striker that you're banking on to to, to at least be, be um, challenging teams in the final third week in, week out. Although, having said that, his goal record was quite good for Ipswich last season. Just 12 league starts he made um, among intense competition for places, but he did get six goals in the end and finished the season quite strongly. At the moment, I'm kind of feeling like Barnsley are going to be the weaker of the three teams relegated from the Championship going into League One. Um, and I was probably expecting Norwood to sign for a bottom half league one side or, or team that we're expecting to be further down the table than maybe Barnsley's um, ambitions are. So it's one that could work. Um, yeah, he's, he's in and around the, the peak years of his career, obviously spending such a long time in non-league and then really bursting onto the scene. He's probably got a bit more left in the tank than some other players um, and strikers of his age. Um, but no, it's a, it's, he's got a high ceiling. It's an, it's an exciting signing, but I don't think he should necessarily be their, their go-to man to, to really spearhead the attack. Yeah, it'll be an interesting one. I mean, Simi, as I sort of touched on, Barnsley have lost the likes of Corley Woodrow, Colton Morris, Victor Adebayejo this summer. Uh, do you think someone like, you know, James Norwood is someone that could bolster what they've, what they've got at the moment? Do you think he's a player that's going to be starting week in, week out for the Tykes? Uh, potentially, if he, can stay, if he can stay fit. I think that was sort of something that plagued his time at Ipswich, you know. Um... I think a good a good move for him this summer, you know, a fresh start and the chance to sort of put those injuries behind him. Um, but I do think they've got some interesting attacking options in like Devante Cole and Aaron Leia Aseka as well. So, I mean, if he can sort of find the form that he did a few years ago down in League Two, where he scored like I think it was nearly thirty goals or something, then you know you have to start him. But again, it's sort of can he stay fit, especially with, uh, you know, the, the crawling fixture in the EFL, how, how they are. I think the one plus one deal aspect of it from Barnsley's perspective is a smart one in that sense, because, you know, if, the, if he does get a, a lot of injuries this season, they can sort of cut their ties at the end of the next campaign. But I do think uh, it's a it's a deal worth taking a, a pun on for Barnsley, given their current situation and the players they've lost, like you said. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any Tykes fans uh, watching this, get yourself in the comments. You happy with James Norwood's uh, arrival at Oakwell? We'd love to hear from you. Right, we've got some more done deals coming up for you next. Uh, Derby County have been particularly active in the summer transfer window over the last few weeks. Uh, their latest addition is Corey Smith, uh, the midfielder leave, left at uh, Swansea City in the summer and has now arrived at Pride Park uh, to uh, feature in the middle of the park for the Rams in what they'll hope is a promotion push in League One. Uh, Marcus, Corey Smith, a player with lots of EFL experience. You know, it is quite a youthful looking Derby County side. It certainly was last year. They had to rely on a lot of their youth players. Do you think adding someone like Corey Smith is just what they need? Just adds that element of experience in the middle of the park that, that could prove quite beneficial in League One? I think it's a very smart pickup. Yeah, um, there were a lot of people speaking glowingly of of Smith's influence off the pitch and, and describing him as something as a model pro when he was hardly really playing in the second half of the season at Swansea last season, knowing he was um, heading towards the end of his contract. So in that sense, he could definitely bring something positive to Derby. Um, I think it kind of depends on what formation Liam Rosinia wants to go with as, as to whether he's going to be a real regular in the first team. I think with players like Max Bird and Conor Hauerhan still in the squad going into a League One campaign, it's hard to see either of them missing out on a start when fully fit. Um, of course, if, if Bird does stay at the club as well. So 
um, in terms of what role within the squad he's going to play. I'm not so sure, but at 31, he, he might not mind with being a little bit of a rotation player at the moment. So I think in terms of the health of the squad, it's, it's definitely a really smart addition and a player that could have potentially um, gone for one more move in, in, in the championship, but has decided to, to, to move to a team that's going to be pushing for promotion in the third tier. Yeah, it's certainly a, a transfer that's caught my eye in particular. I think it's a really good pickup for Derby County. I think if you'd asked Derby County fans, what, two months ago, the sort of players they'd have been able to attract now, a lot of them would have been quite surprised, I'd imagine. Uh, Simon, what's your thoughts on, on Corey Smith? Do you think it's going to enhance Derby's chances of potentially pushing for promotion this season? Yeah, I think it's another sort of championship calibre player that they've signed for, for a League One campaign. I think, obviously, you know, the obvious concerns with, with Derby were the, the squad depth next season. And sort of with every signing they make, that that sort of fears over that are just easing up slightly. And I think they are starting to really shape a, a strong squad now. Um, obviously, as we've touched on, someone who's played a lot of championship football over the last couple of years. So another one that you could sort of view as a bit of a coup for them to to get in um, an experienced head in, in a young team. And that's probably what they're going to need, especially down in, in League One like, uh, next campaign where you're potentially up against you know a bit more experience and hardened sort of EFL players perhaps so yeah I think if uh, the likes of Sibley and Bird remain at the club adding in Hurahan and, and players like Smith um, that gives Derby some really good options next summer uh, season yeah absolutely uh, uh, Derby fans do seem pretty pleased with this particular deal uh, any Rams fans watching let us know your thoughts on Corey Smith uh, the signing of him. We'd love to hear from you. Right, we've got a couple more done deals to wrap up next. Uh, Marcus Harness's future has now been concluded. He signed for Ipswich Town. Uh, Harness has been linked with uh, a number of moves over the last couple of transfer windows, but he has now arrived at Portman Road. Uh, in return, Pompey have signed Joe Piggott on loan for this season. Uh, Marcus, let's come to you then. Uh, we put a tweet out on our Football League World account, kind of showcasing what Marcus Harness can do in terms of his goal contributions. Lots of Pompey fans in our replies suggesting that he's quite inconsistent, can go missing in games. Um, that's their perspective. I mean, what do you make of this deal from an Ipswich perspective? Do you think it's a good signing? Because... He has shown he's got quality at League One level, hasn't he? Yeah, um, it's definitely a coup in in the sense that I thought Harness was was bound to, for a championship move um, this summer if he was going to leave Portsmouth at all. Um, obviously, Ipswich financially are able to to throw their weight around a, a bit like they are um, a, a bottom end championship club, and and to to take what is probably the, the star man away from potentially a direct rival in, in going for a top six finish next season um, is a really good sign in. Um, he, he does tend to be something of a highlight real player at times. Um, you know, that the percentage of his goals that, that end up getting replayed and, and reposted is, is probably quite high. But I think the, the inconsistency claim could go for a lot of players in, in the Portsmouth squad over the last few years, which is why they haven't really been able to build a, a sustained push for automatic promotion when at times it, it looks like they've had the calibre of players in that squad to do so. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be an interesting one. I think he's he's almost like the the Burson Salina replacement, I'd say, from last season. Doesn't look like he's going to be heading back to Portman Road. Probably a cheaper alternative, but a player that's going to play in between um, the four-man midfield and potentially two strikers, which... Uh, McKenna was was deploying um, in in the second half of last season, so it's an exciting move. Um, Harness's chances of uh, playing in the championship in the, in the near future, you have to say, would go up from for moving to Ipswich com compared to staying at Portsmouth. Um, so yeah, it's going to be ex interesting to see how he gets on because yeah, we, we know just what he's capable of, and with with the solid base and the solid platform that's that's in place at Ipswich with um, an incredible defensive process, particularly. In, in that run that they put together in the back end of to the back end of, of last season. I think he's a player that, that could really shine with with added impetus and, and stress on on his performances right at, at the summit of the division. Yeah, a versatile option as well for Kieran McKenna. You know, he can operate on, on either flank or centrally as well, which is a positive solution to have. Uh, so let's just briefly touch on Joe Piggott then and his move to Fratton Park. Uh, Piggott's Career didn't really kick off at Portman Road, struggled to really get frequent game time. He had a lot of competition in uh, attacking areas as well. But you know what he's capable of 
in the EFL with AFC Wimbledon. He really flourished there. Do you think potentially being the main man at Portsmouth could be just what Joe Pickett needs? Because it probably looks like he's going to be playing uh, a lot, given the lack of forward options that, that Danny Cowley has at his disposal right now, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I think you sort of touched on it perfectly there, Sam. You know, he's a player that we've seen score a lot of goals in, in League One before. Um, didn't get as much game time at Ipswich last season. I don't necessarily think that's a, a knock on him at all. Um, and a sort of, you don't want to say step down to Portsmouth because, you know, they're going to be a team that's sort of up their top half of, of League One next season. But I do think, you know, if you, you play in 40 plus games and in the right system, he will score goals and he's shown that at this level. So I think for, for Portsmouth to get him um, for the season as part of the deal, of, you know, it's, it's a good move for them, really, especially considering the, the options are, are lacking a bit up front for them at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Pompey fans, Ipswich fans, get yourself in the comment. Are you happy with that bit of business that both of your clubs have done? Right, let's look at one more done deal next. As we always say on this EFL Transfer Zone show, we could touch on uh, a million done deals, but we just don't have the time. So let's touch on one more. Uh, quite an eye-catching one, this one. Uh, Norwich have completed the signing of Gabriel Sara from Sao Paulo. Uh, 17 goals in 113 appearances for the Brazilian club. Uh, the 23-year-old attacking midfielder arrives in England for the first time. A player, I must admit, I haven't seen too much of, and I don't know if you two have either, uh, but I've seen his, uh, his clips on YouTube. He does look like a very exciting attacking midfielder, for sure. Uh, Multi-million pound deal this as well. Six million pounds is the reported figure that Norwich have stumped up to sign Sara in this summer transfer window. Uh, lots was made of Norwich last year and the uh, or the lack of Emi Buendia. You know, him moving on to Aston Villa. There seemed to be a bit of a lack of creativity in that final third. I suppose Dean Smith will be hoping Sara will fix that issue. Marcus, what's your thoughts on this? I assume you haven't seen, seen too much of Sara play like me, but... Uh, give us your sort of stance on this one. Well, um, Norwich for me are uh, one of the clubs in the EFL that I, I almost blind, blindly trust their recruitment at times, um, particularly in the championship, of course. Um, they've been able to, to conduct really sensible business time and time again. Um, even even coming down the last season when they won the league in 2020-21, I, I didn't make too much of their transfer business, but almost 100% of the players that they did brought in ended up have, having a, a really positive impact. Obviously, yeah, that there's the big Buendia question mark and, and hole in the side compared to the last time that they are in the division. Sara's goal record probably wouldn't suggest that, he, that he's that type of player. Um, and it'll be an interesting transition period between the Brazilian top flight to the championship. But I think the Canaries definitely have the depth in the squad to cope with that if he does need some time um, to bed in. Um, so, yeah, with, with the, the amount of money they, they've spent on him, with the way that they run that club, um, I'm sure that they wouldn't spend that kind of money if they weren't very, very confident that he's, that he's going to be able to to hit the standards that, that they want from him and, and increase Dean Smith's uh, men's chances of kicking on for promotion. So, no, it's going to be a really exciting one. I think, obviously, there's an element of caution because we saw how Martin Piero didn't really make an impact at Middlesbrough last season coming from a South American um, top flight. But... Yeah, a, a similar transfer fee as well coming in for Sarah. But I think, um, yeah, Nor Norwich will be will be backing themselves that they've got this one right. And as I say, I think I think they've got other options in the squad that if it does take time for him to get up to speed, they'll be able to to cope with that. Yeah, Dean Smith seems particularly excited about this deal. I saw the interview he did after this uh, transfer was confirmed. Uh, Describes him as a player full of energy, likes to create goals and create chances. Uh, that's the sort of phrases that Norwich fans will like to hear. Simon, then, just briefly on this one, I assume, again, you haven't seen too much of Sarah play uh, in, in in on TV or anything like that, but but what do you make of this one from a, from a Canary's perspective? Does it look like an, an exciting coup for you? I think it's always sort of exciting uh, when a club in the EFL signs someone from South America. Obviously, we had it a bit with Piero last year, and I'm sure Sarah, among the Norwich fans, has got that sort of bit of hype about him as well. Like you said, I've, I've not seen too much of him. I've just just going off the clips, and I think anyone can sort of look like Ronaldinho on YouTube if you you find the right clips and put them together. So I think I'll reserve sort of judgment on it. But he certainly, from what I've read, he does seem like a 
a really dynamic midfield player that can definitely contribute for for Norwich. And I think joining a club like Norwich as well, a player like that will has the sort of, the sort of best platform to thrive. You know, a team that's probably going to be challenging at the the sharp end of the division. I think he'll have the the, the right players around him that will get the best out of him, and he won't have to do too much. You know, outside of his his job. Yeah, I suppose when you've got a player like Timu Pukki potentially ahead of you as well, who can sort of finish the chances that you serve up to him, uh, he could get quite a nice assist uh, record this season. But we shall see. Uh, one to definitely keep an eye on, Gabriel Sara arriving at Carrow Road ahead of the new season. Right, uh, that's our look at some of the latest done deals in the EFL. We're now going to touch on some of the latest transfer rumours and gossip that is swirling around right now. Uh, Burnley have been a team we've touched on many a time here on EFL Transfer Zone ever since uh, Vincent Company uh, arrived at Turf Moor. They've been particularly active in this summer transfer window. It looks like they're going to sign another really, really exciting attacking championship player. And that comes in the form of Callum O'Hare from Coventry City. Uh, reports suggest that Burnley are closing in on a £9 million deal to sign O'Hare from Coventry City. Uh, Marcus, we'll come to you. We know what Callum O'Hare can do in the second tier. Uh, he's showcased his qualities over the last couple of, of campaigns, perhaps lacking in terms of actual statistics when it comes to goal contributions, but we know the ability he, he possesses. He can clearly cut it at this level. What do you make of this one from a Burnley perspective? Is it a good addition? And is £9 million pounds the right sort of sum of money for, for Callum O'Hare in your, in your eyes? It's a, it would be an outstanding signing, definitely, in my book. Um, I think O'Hare contributes so much with and without the ball. Um, he's probably one of the best pressing forwards in the Championship. Um, his, his energy in the final third is immense. And I think it would potentially take some of the weight off of Scott Twine as well, with potentially a lack of forward options should Cornet, Veghorst or McNeil leave um, in, in the final few weeks of the window. Um, it is his finishing that's been the issue. He hasn't been as clinical. He scored just eight goals in the championship from 19.72 expected goals um, in, in the last two seasons for Coventry. For me, I see that as a long-term positive. I think he'll, he'll eventually start being more clinical. And he's a player that I can see having a, a really, really strong campaign in him where he, he ends up inev inevitably getting a, a move to the Premier League, whether that's by winning promotion with, with the Clarets or not. Um, Nine million, I think he's got two years left on his deal, maybe at Coventry and maybe just one and, and another option. Nine million, considering how crucial he is for Coventry, is probably about right. Um, yeah, the, the potential sky high um, recently turned 24. Um, so, yeah, th this would really be an outstanding sign. And I'd probably argue this would be a better signing than Twine, in my opinion. Um, it's, it's been a real immense player to, to help Coventry sort of stabilise at a championship level and definitely someone that's got ability to play in the Premier League. I don't think many people have concerns about that. It's just whether he can go on the right path in the next couple of seasons. This would be a signing that would definitely increase Burnley's chances of, of kicking on towards promotion in my eyes because at the moment their attacking contingent I think probably isn't quite at the level of some of their other potential competitors. Um, so bringing someone like O'Hare in really would be a statement addition in the window. Yeah, certainly a complete change of tact from from Burnley and, and what we've seen over the last uh, however many seasons uh, at Turf Moor. I'd imagine a lot of Burnley fans must be quite excited about this sort of new uh, attacking feel that, that Vic Vincent Company seems to be instilling at Burnley. O'Hare, a very, uh, very attractive player, good player to watch. Uh, Marcus, I suppose there might be a few Burnley fans watching this show now that have never seen Callum O'Hare play. Could you just sort of just describe him to, to any Burnley fans watching this, what sort of player he is and what sort of player they're going to get? Well, there's an easy comparison to make that a lot of people don't like to make, but he does wear his socks very low down. He is from the Aston Villa Academy. He's got floppy hair. <laughs> um, he is a, a little bit like Jack Grealish-Light um, that we saw in the Championship for Aston Villa. Um, really impressive dribbler. 
Um, as we say, should definitely have more goal, goal contributions than he has been able to achieve in the last few years. But for me, it's it's his energy um, with and without possession that stands out for a younger player that's come from a Premier League academy. He's prepared to, to graft whatever kind of team he's in. Obviously, Coventry's first season in the Championship, the 2020-21 the campaign, it was pretty much a season-long relegation battle. Um, spending a lot of time up against it. And O'Hare was a, a real key player with his energy um, in, in central midfield. He's versatile as well, can play sort of anywhere across a, a front three, probably apart from as a, as a number nine, and also in a, in a deeper, more box-to-box -box role. Um, but if, if company wants to go in and instill a pressing system at Burnley and for that to be the forefront of, the, of their plan to get back to the Premier League, I don't really see many players that you can sign that, that are better um, than Callum O'Hare. Um, yeah, he can contribute in so many ways. And I think he's a, he's a player that should definitely improve um, in, the, in that goals column um, next season. But definitely a player that will get fans on the edge of their seat, as we saw at Coventry last season. It'll be a sore miss for the Sky Blues. But if they're compensated with the kind of fear that, that you've mentioned there, um, yeah, it just shows Burnley's intent. Um, and I think an insight into the way that company wants him to play. Yeah, undoubtedly one of, if not Coventry City's most prized assets, Callum O'Hare for sure. Uh, well, there we go. Uh, we understand Burnley are closing in on a deal to sign Callum O'Hare for a fee in the region of £9 million. Uh, another interesting transfer rumour to touch on next. And uh, we've, we've already spoken about Derby County. Uh, reportedly, Derby are eyeing a move for Rangers striker Ki Ma Roof. Uh, Roof scored 16 goals uh, for Gio Van Bronckhorst's side last season, but uh, the 29-year-old was plagued with injuries that last term. And uh, Liam Rossini's Derby are considering a loan move for the former Leeds United man. Simon, let's come to you on this one. This certainly caught me by surprise because Roof's a player that, for me, could very easily be playing in the Championship, if not lower end Premier League. What's your thoughts on this one? Yeah, it's just another really, really ambitious sort of transfer from Derby, really. And if they pulled this one off, it would just be another cracking addition to, to their front line. Obviously, we've seen David McGoldrick go there and you can sort of perhaps understand that one a bit more because of his age. But certainly, like a 29-year-old Kimar Roof going 16 goals for Rangers last season and very limited minutes you know in league one you you just think he would he would almost guarantee goals essentially yeah. like you say he, he he could be playing in the championship who wants to rangers last season you know he sort of didn't really get a look in in the league but in the cup competitions and when he did get his chance he scored goals so i don't really think he could have done much more of it, other than stay stay a bit healthier perhaps but if Derby pulled this off again, you know, it's just another signing that just takes him that little bit higher on the sort of League One prediction tables at the start of the season, I think. Yeah, absolutely. It would, uh, it would certainly shock me if this one did come to fruition personally. Marcus, uh, your stance on uh, Roof to Derby links? Well, I, I don't think I've seen a player go from the Europa League final to, to League One in the space of a few months before. Um, I think if he is available on loan, championship clubs should definitely be looking at bringing him in. Um, it also makes me a little bit sceptical after everything what Derby have just been through if, if they're going to be able to to afford the wages of, of someone like Kimar Roof. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a surprising link to me um, considering where he could be playing his football as, as we've mentioned. If he is available on loan, surely there's championship clubs that could go in and, and beat Derby to his signature. Um, yeah, it, it would be one hell of a signing, but it seems like a, a long way to go if, if they are to pull it off then. Yeah, that would be a very eyebrow raising, but it would put them right in contention um, in League One. Um, yeah, that would be an outstanding sign and his, his ability is way above League One level. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any Derby fans, get yourself in the comments. Would you like to see Kimar Roof uh, join Derby in the summer? I'd imagine most of you would. Uh, right, we've got a few more transfer rumours to touch upon next. Uh, this, this has all the makings of a EFL transfer saga, and that's Maxwell Cornett's future. Uh, he's been linked away uh, from a move uh, from Burnley uh, ever since they got relegated from the Premier League. There's been a lot of interest in the uh, Ivory Coast International in particular this summer. AFC Bournemouth and Nottingham Forest have already had two bids rejected for Cornett this summer, uh, and Fulham 
seem to be the latest club, but very much in the mix to sign Cornet uh, in this summer transfer window. Uh, Marcus, let's come to you. It almost feels inevitable that, that Cornet won't be a Burnley player come the start of the new EFL season. Uh, of the sort of linked clubs, is there any that stand out to you? You know, like I said, we've seen uh, you know, Forest link with him, uh, West Ham, Fulham, you know, lots of teams. Is there anyone that stands out? Well, obviously, uh, West Ham will be able to offer him European football where the other three won't. So that could play a, an individual role potentially in, in where he chooses. I think Fulham stands out to me as, as the most sort of viable option in terms of getting into their starting eleven at least. Um, I think he could maybe come in on that left-hand side in, ahead of uh, Naiskins Cabano. He's, he's got great versatility as well, though, which will probably make him a, a more exciting prospect for those managers. I'm not sure if he fits into that 3-5-2 system as much under Steve Cooper at Forest. Um, so, yeah, I'd say West Ham or Fulham for me. Um, I think Everton's potentially in for a, another tricky season, maybe one to avoid in the short term. And, and with four years left on his contract, I'm not sure... How, how feasible that would be for them. Obviously, just taking in a lot of money for Richarlison, but I know they're a little bit up against it with profit and sustainability regulations. So uh, I would say West Ham or Fulham. Fulham's the one where I can see him starting. Um, Moyes tends to be really reliable, um, really sort of loyal to, to the attacking players that have got West Ham in, in the position they have been in the last couple of seasons. So if I was in Corno's position, I'd probably take the move to Fulham. Um, would enhance their chances of staying in the Premier League and uh, would be a great asset to add to Silver's squad. Yeah, I just like to make a correction. It wasn't Forrest and Bournemouth that have had bids rejected for Cornet. It is, in fact, Everton. Uh, Everton have had uh, bids rejected uh, for Cornet. They are looking to uh, submit a revised bid uh, for the Burnley player. Just just lastly then, Simon, on Cornet, is there any way you see him sticking around at Turf Moor? Or do you expect him to, to, to move on in a few weeks? Uh, I mean, it's hard to say because I think if Burnley are going to be solid on that sort of 18 million stance and they want it, you know, this summer and not with a loan with um, the option to buy or obligation to buy, in that scenario, you know, you could potentially see him staying because I think there are a few players in the Championship, Saar and Dennis, uh, along with Cornet, that the Premier League clubs are looking at. And obviously, you know, there's only so many clubs that these players can go to. So I think if Burnley you know, a really solid on that 18 million stance. Mm. I would be surprised if he stayed because I think, you know, he is a player that's worth 18 million. But, I mean, you could you could potentially see it. But I think once once a few more transfers start to fall and clubs become a bit more flush with cash, I think a Premier League club will, will come in for him. Yeah, Chelsea have also been linked with Cornet in this summer transfer window. So he's not sure of potential suitors uh, Maxwell Cornet at Burnley. Uh, any Clarets fans watching this, get yourself in the comments. What do you make of uh, the situation with Maxwell Cornet right now? Do you expect him to depart within the next few weeks? Uh, once more, another player we've spoken about a lot here on EFL Transfer Zone over the last couple of weeks, and that is Marcus Tavernier. Uh, he's had uh, bids from a number of Premier League clubs over the last few days. Uh, Nottingham Forest and Bournemouth um, have submitted bids for Marcus Tavernier, but they have been rebuffed. Uh, Borough are expecting an auction for their midfielder, uh, if reports are to be believed. Uh, they want £15 million at the very least uh, for their midfield man in this summer transfer window. Lots of clubs being linked with a move for him. Leicester City. Uh, also firmly in the chase for Tavernier. Marcus, let's come to you then on this one. Uh, you no, know, there's been lots of different clubs in the Premier League linked with him. As I said, Bournemouth and Forest have had bids rejected for the player in this window. Uh, where do you think is the best next step for Marcus Tavernier, or is it remaining at the Riverside for another season? Um, I, I, I'm split between two. I, I think out of the interested clubs, I like Nottingham Forest as a fit. Um, I think he could play the, the role that Philip Zinkenagel did um, in the second half of last season if, if Cooper does want to go with a sort of 3 4 1 2 shape. Because he, he did, um, Tavernier did play in, in further forward areas before uh, becoming more of a box to box mid midfielder under, under Chris Wilder last season. So uh, I think Forrest would stand out in that regard. Obviously, Cooper, with, with such a good record developing younger players, I think he, he would be 
that, that makes Forest a more attractive destination for for a lot of players um, looking to to make the move up from the Championship at the moment. I also think he, he's so valued at Middlesbrough. I think that's why they've probably slapped the 15 million price tag on him. I, I would say he's probably you'd probably be overpaying a little bit if you did pay that, but it's. It's sort of based on how much does he mean to Middlesbrough, how hard would he be to replace because he's one of the first names on the team sheet um, going into next season if, if he does stay at the club. With two years left on his deal as well, but Borough in quite a, a strong position that they, they could still get quite a hefty fee for him next summer um, if they're not able to, to, to get promotion this season. So I'd probably see the the, the most simple fit and slot into the starting eleven at Forest. Um, but I also think it wouldn't be a bad thing for his career if he did stick around for another season at the Riverside. Borough fans, let us know your thoughts on Marcus Tavernier. Is he worth £15 million? That is the reported price tag that's been slapped upon his head in this summer transfer window. Right, we've got a couple more transfer rumours to uh, touch upon next. Uh, we've had a comment come in on YouTube from Peter Fryer. Good to have you with us this afternoon. Uh, Borough fan. Uh, we desperately need a couple of strikers at Borough, whether we are waiting for the Spence deal to be confirmed before we bring players in. Uh, that is certainly an area that Chris Wilder has made no secret that they need to uh, add in uh, in this summer transfer window. Of course, Sandra Spora uh, and Balogun and Aaron Connolly have returned to their parent clubs uh, following uh, last season. Uh, some new recruits are needed in the attacking areas. And the latest man being linked to a move to the Riverside is Brentford striker Marcus Force. Uh, Force spent uh, the latter end of last season on loan at Hull City, uh, only scored one goal and provided one assist in, in 11 appearances uh, for the Tigers. Uh, but he is being earmarked for a move to Middlesbrough in the summer transfer window. Simi, uh, Simi, let's come to you then on this one. Uh, is Force the man that can really enhance what Borough have got in attacking areas? I mean, the numbers at Hull weren't great, but again, it's quite a small sample size, only 11 appearances. We have seen him score goals uh, for Brentford and AFC Wimbledon when he was on loan there as well. Uh, what's your take on this one? I just, I'm just not sure he's the sort of proven option that, that Middlesbrough really want. You know, Chris Wilder, as you said, made it no secret last season that he wanted a bit more from his striking options. And I think Marcus Force is another one that could potentially leave him a, a bit frustrated next campaign. I think, obviously, his first couple of years at Brentford, he did suffer a few injuries. And by the time the next season came, Ivan Tony was sort of on the scene, which is always going to make it difficult to get game time. If you sort of look, he, he, he played like 50 games in 2021, I think, in all competitions. But the minutes were like the equivalent of playing 20. So he's someone that's, that really had to make do with a bit part minutes at Brentford over the last few years. And his, his time at Hull, he didn't really pull up any trees, you know, one goal. But I do think perhaps across a, a bit more of a sustained period, a full campaign, he could sort of find a bit of goal scoring form. But, you know, if I'm Middlesbrough, he's not the sort of proven option I'm looking for. And I'd certainly be looking to bring in another another forward at least if force came in yeah uh, it's an interesting one like you say the uh the statistics don't necessarily back back him up but uh, there's definitely a player in there i feel having seen him play uh before for brentford uh, marcus what's your stance on force and the middles relinks yeah i do agree with simon i'm not completely sure he, he's the one to, to really push them to, towards those top two places like they'll, they'll be potentially th thinking of I think there's potentially a little bit of friction between Chris Wilder and, and the recruitment team at Middlesbrough with the type of targets that, that are coming out. You've got on the one side these these Chris Wilder type signings like Jordan Rhodes and, and Dwight Gale that we've had earlier in the window. And on the flip side to that, you've got like Cameron Archer, Marcus Force and Adam Armstrong, potentially players that the recruitment team are, are more looking at. Um, yeah, Force does not scream to me like a, like a Chris Wilder signing. So it'd be... Interesting to see how he got on. It was a bit of a, a knock for his confidence and I think his reputation that that second half of last season at Hull City just really didn't work out. And of course, as, as Simon points towards, it's been hard to really get a judge on him because of the he's been an impact sub basically at Brentford and, and they tend to look better uh, in teams that are playing well as, as well. So 
yeah, it's an interesting one. I think if he does go there, I can't see him being first choice um, immediately anyway. So I think Barra should probably be prioritising other targets if they can, um, because, yeah, the, the clock is ticking for them um, at the moment. They've got like Duncan Watmore and Josh Coburn as probably their first choice duo up top. So, yeah, if they're really going to be automatic promotion contenders, they need to get a move on. Yeah, that's certainly uh, an area that does need improving uh, ahead of Middlesbrough's first game of the season next week. Uh, right, one more transfer rumour to touch on next. Uh, Chelsea's attacking midfielder Tino Andrin is attracting uh, interest from the Championship Coventry. Uh, Huddersfield, QPR and Norwich all keeping tabs on the 20-year-old situation. Uh, Thomas Tuchel has uh, given him the green light to go out on loan once again uh, for next season. Did spend last season uh, on loan at Huddersfield Town, but struggled for consistent game time. Lots of niggly injuries uh, made it hard for him to really break through into Carlos Corbin's side uh, last term. Uh, Marcus, we'll come to you then first on this one. Um, what do you, I mean, of these linked clubs, is there anyone that stands out for you? Huddersfield, again, in the running to re-sign him. They've obviously seen something in the player that, that suggests he could make a difference next term. Um, is there anyone that stands out in terms of a, a next destination for, for Andrew? Well, from the point of view of those four clubs, I think given Andrew's fitness record and he's yet to really prove himself in, in senior football and definitely in the championship, you want to have plenty of other players in his position to potentially use him as, as a bit of a luxury wildcard option. Um, we did see his class in, in glimpses with the Terriers last season. It's, it's really clear that there's a player in there and he's got, um, you know, his stock's quite high in the Chelsea Academy for that reason. Um, so out of those, that quartet, I would probably look to, to QPR and Norwich, potentially having more uh, options in those positions that if he's not able to, to to be available regularly, you're able to cope with that. Whereas looking at the um, Huddersfield and Coventry, especially if O'Hare leaves um, Coventry, you're, you're looking at as a, as a player that you want to rely on um, week in, week out to be contributing in the attacking third. And I don't think his past record and at this stage of his career, you can really rely on him to do that. So I think it would be um, better for both parties if he was a go to go to a club where he could start the season at least being a rotation option and, and then... Really, if he if he can cement his place in in the starting lineup, then then that would be available to him. So Norwich and QPR stand out for me out of those four clubs. Okay, uh, well there we go. Tino Andrin attracting interest uh, from a host of EFL sides: uh, Norwich, Coventry, QPR, and Huddersfield. Uh, four of the uh, link sides right now. Uh, right, well, that brings an end to today's EFL Transfer Zone show here on Football League World TV. Marcus, Simon, thanks for joining me on this afternoon's show. Thanks for everyone that's tuned in to watch us uh, on this very hot Monday afternoon. Uh, we've got two really exciting shows coming up for you tomorrow. We're going to be taking a look at Huddersfield Town. We're going to be getting a uh, Huddersfield Town fan, Graham Rayner on the channel and then later on we're talking to Coventry City fan Neil Littlewood about the Sky Blues' chances uh, of success next season in the Championship. If you are watching this on repeat on YouTube, please do stick a like in below this video and subscribe to the channel. We are edging ve very, very close now to 1,000 subscribers. We're so close to so please. Every new subscriber really helps us uh, get uh, nearer to that goal. Uh, but from myself, Marcus and Simon, we shall see you soon.